Today we will learn the basics of VPN instances. We will also discuss their main application scenarios and how to configure VPNs on switches. First, we'll see an overview of VPN instances. First, let's take a look at the background of this VPN instance. In the middle, a core switch is deployed. Two access switches are used for layer 2 link switching. VLAN 10, connected to SW1, is a service network. And VLAN 200, connected to SW2, is a management network. The service network must communicate with the production network through the core switch. VLAN 200 also must communicate with the management network through the core switch. The gateways of VLAN 10 and VLAN 200 are the core switch. The two VLANs are directly connected to the core switch. Therefore, they can directly communicate with each other. However, to ensure security, the service and management networks must be isolated during network planning. Generally, one or two solutions is used to isolate the two networks. In the first solution, an ACL is configured on the switch to prevent access to certain network segments. However, the scalability of an ACL is poor if a new network segment appears. The ACL content must be modified with consideration of the traffic coming into or going out of the device. In the second solution, two isolated physical networks are created with a core switch serves as the gateway for each network. However, this increases hardware costs. Are there any methods to improve scalability without increasing hardware costs? To do this, a VPN instance can be used. A VPN instance is equivalent to a virtual device. Service traffic is processed by the root instance of the core switch. In addition, a VPN instance is created on the core switch and the management traffic is processed by this instance. In this way, the traffic of the two networks is isolated. The VPN instance is isolated from the root device. Without increasing hardware costs, it uses an independent routing table. The industry term for VPN instance is Virtual Routing and Forwarding VRF. It is a key technology in the MPLS VPN architecture and is similar to the concept of virtual devices. VRF logically divides a physical device into one or more virtual devices. You can create virtual interfaces for these virtual devices. They have independent routing tables, independent route selection processes, and independent interfaces. VRF can be separated from MPLS. The instance virtualization feature of VRF can be used for service or data isolation on network devices. By default, all the interfaces of network devices belong to their root instances. By default, a VPN instance is not bound to any interface you need to bind a VPN instance to an interface of the root instance. This interface is dedicated to the VPN instance. The VPN instances are isolated from each other and are also isolated from the root device. A VPN instance does not forward received traffic to the other VPN instances or to the root device. When a VPN instance is created on the firewall, the VPN instance can be called a virtual firewall. Let's see an example. Before a VPN instance is deployed, the core switch is connected to two routers. 
and the two routers are connected to two external network segments. In addition, the switch is connected to two VLANs with different services. When no VPN instance is applied, the four VLAN IF interfaces, including their direct routes, are reachable. The routing table of the switch is shown in the right figure. To access two remote networks, the static route protocol is used to import the routes destined to the two remote networks to the routing table. If the service traffic on the left needs to be isolated from the service traffic on the right, use the VPN instance. You can create a VPN instance on the core switch and then bind VLAN IF 201 and VLAN IF 200 to the VPN instance. The VPN instance can be thought of as a new switch. It has two interfaces and its routing table has two director routes and routes to remote network segment 2.2.2.0/24 these routes will disappear from the routing table of the root instance in addition to configuring static routes for the vpn instance you can run multiple dynamic routing protocols in the vpn instance when configuring an OSPF process, you can set an ID for it. The process ID is locally valid and uniquely identifies the process. The switch has two instances. One is the root instance and it connects to the router on the left side. The other is a VPN instance and it connects to the router on the right side. The two VPN instances run OSPF. The two OSPF processes can be isolated only when they use different process IDs and are bound to corresponding VPN instances. If an OSPF process is not bound to any VPN instance, the OSPF process is bound to the root instance by default. Next, Let's take a look at how to configure VPN instances. Create a VPN instance on the switch. The name of the VPN instance can be customized. After the VPN instance is created, its view is displayed. You need to set an RD value for the instance. The RD value plays an important role in MPLS and is used to distinguish customers. This value must be defined and can be customized. In this way, the VPN instance is created. Although the instance has been created, it is not bound to any interface. Therefore, you need to bind the VPN instance to interfaces. Run this command to bind the VPN instance to a VLAN IF interface physical interface, or an Ethernet sub-interface. The routing table of the VPN instance needs to be maintained. You can add static routes to and check the routing table of the VPN instance. You can also perform the ping and tracer operations in the VPN instance. Ensure that the related commands have the VPN instance parameter. When creating an OSPF process in the VPN instance view, add this keyword to associate the OSPF process with the corresponding instance. Next, let's see a typical configuration case. On the network shown in the preceding figure, the networks of the two sites are connected through a least line between the core switches. At site 1, the core switch has two user VLANs, VLAN 10 and VLAN 20. VLAN 10 is a service VLAN, while VLAN 20 is a disaster recovery VLAN. The default gateways of the two VLANs are Core SW Site 1. Core SW Site 1 is interconnected with FW1, FW2 through VLAN 30. Static routes are used for interconnection. 
VRRP is deployed on the intranet firewall. The VRRP virtual IP address is 192.168.30.1. Core SW Site 1 is interconnected with the Core SW Site 2 through VLAN 1000. VLAN 20 of Site 1 communicates with the VLAN 21 of Site 2. For Site 1, VLAN 10 and VLAN 20 must be completely isolated. After the configuration is complete, VLAN 10 can communicate with the firewall, VLAN 20 can communicate with VLAN 21, and VLAN 10 and VLAN 2021 are completely isolated. Let's see the topology from the perspective of the logical layer. The core switches are connected to the E9000. The information in orange is about the root instance. VLAN IF10 is connected to VLAN 10, and VLAN IF30 is connected to the firewall. The information in green is about the VPN instance. VLAN IF20 and VLAN IF1000 are added to the VPN instance. The configuration procedure is as follows. 1. Create VLANs 10, 20, 30, and 1000 on Core SW Site 1. 2. Configure a specific Layer 2 interface on Core SW Site 1 and bind the interface to a VPN instance. 3. Create a VPN instance named test on Core SW Site 1. 4. On Core SW Site 1, bind VLAN IF 20 and VLAN IF 1000 to VPN instance test to thoroughly isolate the two interfaces from the root device. 5. Configure a static default route on the root device on Core SW Site 1 and set the next hop address of the route to VRRP virtual IP address 192.168.30.1. 6. Configure a static route to VLAN 21 for VPN instance test on Core SW Site 1 and set the next hop address of the route to Core SW Site 2. 7. Note. The return route destined for 192.168.10.0/24 must be configured on FW1, FW2. That's all for today. Thanks for listening.